We pick up our Bible study tonight on the wisdom of Proverbs as we seek to learn from the wisdom and knowledge and insight and understanding from King Solomon and how we can utilize these lessons in our own lives. We pick up this week as we read from the Holman Christian Standard Bible in Proverbs chapter 25, and we'll pick up at verse 8. Don't take a matter to court harshly. Otherwise, what will you do afterward if your opponent humiliates you? Uh, basic goal here, be respectful of others. Uh, don't go in trying to smash someone, so to speak, uh, but yet be humble. Uh, we can still be humble in our arguments. We can be respectful in our disagreements and still present our case in a fashionable and, and uh, convincing form. Uh, otherwise, if your opponent uh, wins the argument, wins the debate, wins uh, this court battle as it's presented to us here from uh, Proverbs chapter 25, uh, present yourself appropriately. Uh, we, I know I have a, a, a sort of an issue with being a little loud and over the top. People can take things a little bit more aggressively and, and maybe I'm not intending to be other than like stressing a point. Uh, but sometimes people can take that harshly. We've got to be aware of that and try to present ourselves uh, in, a, in a more fashionable, respectable form that will be received appropriately by others. Verse 9, make your case with your opponent without revealing another's secret. Otherwise, verse 10, the one who hears will disgrace you and you'll never live it down. Uh, don't get so into something that we take things that are promissory notes from one to another of uh, secrets, it says, things we know about others that maybe no one else does that would be hurtful to them. Uh, we're not trying to humiliate others as what could happen here, King Solomon teaches, is that it could turn around and uh, maybe in, in the same context of revealing another secret. Um, otherwise, it says in verse 10, the one who hears will disgrace you and you'll never live it down. So if we start slinging mud, as we like to say, uh, and we're trying to uh, humiliate another through that, maybe they might sling some mud back at us and it might be a little bit more mud than what we slung on them and we'll wind up being the embarrassed ones. Uh, once again, present ourselves, even in an argument, uh, in a court case kind of looking thing, um, in a disagreement, an argument, um, we can argue and still present our case without getting mad and throwing a fit and that kind of thing. Um, which would be reflective of if you you get mad and you're throwing a fit and you're slinging mud, so to speak, uh, what comes back at you might be worse than what you threw out to start with. Uh, let's be respectable of one another. We all have disagreements. Um, we all get into what we would call arguments, but we can do it respectfully to one another, presenting our case and hopefully in the end, the, the agreement can come to an understanding that whoever was in the wrong can learn from it and grow. That's humility. That's being appropriate uh, to grow in our lives as a person, as a, a child of God. Verse 11, a word spoken at the right time is like gold, is like gold apples on a silver tray. Uh, Gold apples on a silver tray. If you were given a tray of gold apples, you might say, well, what's that mean? If someone gave you a tray full of gold apples, would you be pretty happy to have them? Okay, maybe all you're going to do is sell them, but you're going to be pretty happy to have them. So a word spoken at the right time. Uh, 
brings that same sort of satisfaction and understanding uh, to a person. Um, it might be word, words of wisdom. It might be words of correction. It might be uh, words of love or, or whatever it may be. If it's spoken at the right time, in the right place, in the right context, in the right tone of voice, with the right attitude, at the right time, King Solomon says, like giving a tray of golden apples. Uh, it, it's, it, it's soothing, it's comforting, it's helpful. It brings happiness and joy in one's life to have that comforting and support. A wise correction, verse 12, to a receptive ear is like a gold ring or an ornament of gold. Same thing as verse 11, spoken in a little bit different way, but he actually specifies uh, a wise correction to a receptive ear. Now, what's the, the prerequisites here? The correction that we're, that is being given is not slanderous. It's not hateful. It's wise. Uh, we've been learning all through Proverbs about what it means to be wise and to gain wisdom and the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of ourselves, but the wisdom that comes only from God as we seek his will for our life and follow what he teaches us all through, not just Proverbs, but the whole Bible. Um, you know, we're seeking wisdom from King Solomon here, but uh, the wisdom that Jesus teaches in the gospel accounts of his ministry on this earth and the way we should live our lives um, is receiving wisdom and growing in that as we follow that and seeking to 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 walk in the footsteps of Jesus, um, doing wise things, a wise correction. So a, a correction that's not slanderous, it's not hurtful, it's wise, it's given an appropriate tone, it's given an appropriate time to a receptive ear. Now sometimes someone's not ready to receive correction and we try to force it on them anyway. We've had that happen to us. Um, it's hard to receive wise, even if it's wise criticism or correction, it's hard to receive that if we're not in the right mindset to do so. So you need the wise correction on one hand from a person, but you also need a receptive ear, someone who's willing to, to take that in and learn from it, which in both cases is growing in wisdom and learning wisdom and understanding. You're gaining knowledge and insight all of the things we're trying to reach and, and learn here from King Solomon are in gaining wise correction. We must have a receptive ear to gain it. It's like a gold ring or an ornament of gold. Once again, he, he compares it to receiving a, 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 a piece of gold and an, and an ornament or jewelry. Uh, always makes us happy to receive such a gift. Verse 13, to those who send him, a trustworthy messenger is like the coolness of snow on a harvest day. He refreshes the life of his masters. Um, okay, in this day of, of King Solomon, we didn't have the USPS and, and UPS and FedEx. Uh, they sent messages. Uh, a king would write a message, seal it, or whoever it might be would seal it uh, with a wax stamp showing their signet ring or, or stamp on it, give it to someone to take to this other person, wherever they might be, across town or maybe across country or in another country. Uh, the messenger would be uh, tasked with making sure this message got properly and safely to the rightful person. Um, these messages could be tampered with. Uh, they could be lost. Many different things could happen in the process of the message getting to the right person. Uh, but to those who send them and trust them, uh, the coolness of snow on a harvest day, it's a refreshing coolness to the hot end of, end of a hot summer. Uh, this person, this messenger, refreshes the life 
of his master. It's a comforting feeling. It's it's confidence and uh, security in what you're doing and that the message you're sending is getting to the people that it needs to, to receive it. Um, it. It just brings to mind that Jesus preaching the, the gospel, the parables, um, just think how refreshed his life was to know that because many times we see where Jesus preached, but the people didn't receive it. So little work or in a, uh, might say few miracles were done here because the people didn't believe when we read about Jesus. But to think of the, the richness and the fullness and the, the refreshing in Jesus' life as he, he came to teach us about the kingdom of heaven, uh, and when he, he gave such a message, uh, when he knew the people received it and people were saved and people came to believe in him and that God sent him to save the world from sin, as, as uh, John the Baptist declared at the beginning of the ministry of Christ in John chapter 1, verse 29, uh, John the Baptist says, Behold, uh, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Uh, and also in John three seventeen, uh, you know, that God didn't send his son just uh, to condemn the world, but to, that he might save the world from sin. Um, and when Jesus preached a message and, and the people were able to understand it and realize the necessity for the need for Christ in their lives, even before he was crucified, uh, that people would put their faith in him as their savior uh, was such a refreshing uh, day for Jesus as all of heaven rejoices, the Bible teaches us, every time someone repents and gives their life to, to Christ and believes in God and makes him their savior, all of heaven rejoices. Uh, so verse 14, chapter 25, the man who boasts about a gift that does not exist is like clouds and wind without rain. Uh, what we're saying here is it's just a false piece of hope. Uh, be honest. Uh, don't go around saying things that's not true. Uh, you know, he compares this to clouds and wind without rain. Now, you know, if it's a hot, dry season and the clouds billow up and it starts, the wind picks up and uh, it looks like rain and everyone's getting excited because we're going to get some refreshing rain. Now, sometimes we get too much rain. We've had a lot of that in places. Uh, but in a dry, arid climate, when the rain's coming and you see it, uh, you can almost smell it. And then there's no rain. Uh, it, it has the same type of disclosure as the man who boasts about a gift that doesn't exist. Hey, I got something for you. I want to bring it to you. And then he never does. Get excited and never get fulfilled through it. Verse 15, a ruler can be persuaded through patience and a general tongue can break a bone. Uh, what do we mean here? Um, A ruler can be persuaded through patience. Uh, it also makes me think of the persistent widow who continued to come back to the king to present her case. And finally, he gave in because of her persistence. Uh, and and the, the patience of the person to continue to go back in the being persistent, uh, patiently yet persistently, presenting their case in hope of their uh, ruling. Um, a gentle tongue can break a bone. Uh, and, and it's tied in the same sentence. A ruler can be persuaded through patience. Okay, we got that. Uh, continue to present your case. Uh, give the facts. Eventually, uh, the, the person ruling over this can, can be persuaded to see your side of an argument. 
And a gentle tongue can break a bone. A gentle tongue. You might have some cold, hard facts, uh, but yet presenting them with a gentle tongue, presenting the cases um, in an obviously um, concrete way, but yet can be gentle, can break a bone, uh, can break a person, so to speak, from their view of one thing that maybe you presented some wisdom, knowledge, insight to give them understanding so that they realize that what they're doing or the way they are uh, is wrong because of the the information that you have presented proves to them that the, the what they're doing or what they believe maybe is wrong, but yet it can be done in a gentle way and still break that person from where they're at and soften that heart as we uh, see God talking to the Israelites in the Old Testament about their hardened hearts and and to to soft to soften them. Excuse me. Um, that uh, the gentle tongue sometimes it's almost like showing love to your enemies kind of thing. Um, they don't expect you to show love to them because they've shown hate to you. They expect hate back. And when you show them love, they don't know how to process that. And it breaks them. The uh, Bible says it's like pouring hot coals onto them. Uh, they they can't deal with it, it but, and it breaks them. Uh, verse 16, if you find honey, eat only what you need. Otherwise, you'll get sick from it and vomit. Uh, pretty good sins. We all understand you eat too much honey. It's going to make you sick. Um, take things in proportion. Um, there's a place for everything. We can take what we need and, you know, too much of a good thing winds up ruining the whole thing. So like the sweetness of honey, uh, a dap of honey tastes so good and sweet and uh, almost gives a, an excitement to a person that that was so good. But if you eat too much, it's going to overpower the goodness and upset your stomach and make you ill. So we got to take things in proportion properly and uh, make sure that we're monitoring our lives uh, in what we do, what we say, how we address things. Uh, Verse 17, seldom set foot in your neighbor's house, otherwise, he, otherwise he'll get sick of you and hate you. Uh, kind of leads to the overbearing, uh, maybe uh, presenting a case or making note of something once maybe in, in a joking way is funny. Uh, as it continues, it becomes a point where it gets old and now it's agitating and it makes or breaks bonds of relationships because one went too far with something. The same as, as like eating too much honey. Uh, a little bit's great, you know, but if you go too far with it, you're going to eat too much and get sick. Um, bringing yourself to to it says to your neighbor's house if you go visit every day unannounced uninvited eventually you're going to be intruding uh, take things in proportion is what we're looking at and finding that proper proportion uh, is the key how do we do that we do that through prayer we do that through seeking God's guidance in our lives we do that through reading his word and trying to find meaning for our lives in it as we're doing here in the study of Proverbs, but we can do throughout the Bible. The Bible is full. Old Testament, New Testament is full of lessons of life for us to learn from so that we don't make, in some cases, the same mistakes that are made by uh, people that we read about in the Bible. 
And in other cases that we will read and follow what we learn and see that people have done in their lives and opening their hearts to Christ, um, seeking to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. What's that mean? It means to follow his teachings that, you know, Jesus said to, uh, in quoting the Old Testament as we tie it all together, uh, in quoting Deuteronomy and Leviticus, uh, love the Lord your, your God with all your heart, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's a new commandment that Jesus gave. Uh, he says, in doing these things, all will know that you are my disciples. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. So we want to try to emulate that in our lives as we seek to follow Jesus. Dear Lord, as we are striving with some things that can make us overbearing, that can lead to bad things because of too much involvement with it. Uh, Lord, we want to be the people that you have created us to be. We want to emulate Jesus in our lives and follow in his footsteps to be the people that put you first and set that example for others in humility and kindness to others that we can have a proper relationship with our neighbor and with you as our Savior and Jesus Christ, Lord. Help us to learn to be proportionate in the things, even the good things that we have, that we would not get overbearing with it, but that we would seek humility and being loving of our neighbors and to respect all those around us in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.